This evening, I I, mean, I haven't said hello. Uh, my name's Erica, and I'd like to welcome you to the um, Thursday night presentation. Hi. You will be muted. You'll be able to ask questions of Todd at the end of his um, presentation. Hello. So we'll be starting, let me see what time it is. We'll be starting in two minutes. And I'll introduce, do a short introduction of uh, Todd Kaldikoff. And um, then we will get to listen to his amazing presentation. That's a very nice picture you have up there, Todd. I like it. Yeah, that's <laughs> taken from the Tipu Sultan's palace, you know, summer palace in South India. Very cool. Yeah. You weren't supposed to take photos, but I managed to take some photos. <laughs> <laughs> no Snuck. flash, no flash, so. <laughs> Snuck them out. <laughs> Nowadays, I don't think they can stop people because everyone has a cell phone. All right. <laughs> it's lovely. So I'm just going to make a few points um, uh, about your uh, Ayurvedic practice. If there's anything short that you'd like to add before you start your presentation, please do. Sure. Um, just please make it short. <clears throat> okay. All right. <clears throat> we'll start and I'll just invite people in as they show up, Todd. Sure. So good evening and welcome to the Ayurvedic Association of Canada Thursday night webinar. Um, we have taken a summer hiatus and we will be starting um, our series again. Probably not every week in the beginning, uh, probably every two weeks, but if you just keep looking at Facebook, you will see when our next one is. But this evening we have um, a gentleman named Todd Kaldikoff, who is going to do a presentation on Dinacharya, which I'm really excited to, to hear about. Um, Todd's been um, an Ayurvedic practitioner for over 20 years. He's written two or three books, which he'll talk about at the end. And if you're interested in, um, in getting a hold of his books, um, you'll be able to do that. Um, I've read one of them called Food is Medicine. I read that probably, when did that book come out, Todd? Uh, 2011. Right, I probably read it in 2012, but it was a good read. Thank you. And um, Todd now lives in, in tell me again, no, Powell River. Powell River, right, up at the tip. And he has a large farm or, or garden, and he's doing all kinds of different things than he did when he was living in Vancouver. And he has online courses that you can take also that he can talk to you about at the end. So I will give the screen to you, Todd, and uh, let you do your presentation on Dinacharya. Thank you for uh, doing this for us. My pleasure, thank you. Okay, well, good evening, everyone. Thanks uh, so much for the introduction. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to be here with the Ayurveda Association of Canada to spend some time talking about Ayurveda and lifestyle practices, a term that we use to encompass those practices, although not, not exclusively referring to those practices, is this term dinacharya. So tonight's going to be really a brief lecture. We don't have a lot of time, uh, and you know this is a subject that I could spend you know, several days talking about. So, uh, and in fact, in my presentation, you'll see it's way more detailed than I'm going to be able to cover. So I'm just going to be covering kind of the highlights or the the major points, and hopefully just get the basic idea across, the basic principles and practices of Dhinacharya. And yes, my orientation is to make it practical so that you're able to implement these measures in your daily life 
to help support your overall health and wellness. Because in Ayurveda, Dhinacharya is the primary method of prevention, right? It is a practice undertaken by the wise, recommended by the wise, to preserve health and to maintain a long lifespan. So essentially this is the foundation of Ayurvedic preventative medicine. Okay. So yeah, a little bit about me. I'm a medical herbalist and a practitioner of Ayurveda. Uh, I've written a few books, uh, a textbook, uh, another book on um, nutrition called Food is Medicine. I'm editor of a text written by Vaidya Manabhajacharya, a, a venerable physician from Kathmandu, Nepal, called Ayurveda in Nepal. And I've also authored a number of different courses as well as I have also um, developed um, materials for teaching and written a number of uh, academic papers published in various journals over the years. So the way to understand Ayurveda, how to sort of put it into context is to understand this term called dharma. And when we use this term dharma, you might have come across it before. It has a very particular context within Hindu circles or uh, Buddhist philosophy referring to those teachings that are implemented by them. In the context of Ayurveda, dharma simply means the natural way of things. It's a naturalistic approach to health and wellness. And this is to say that human beings are part of the natural environment. We're not separate from it. And I know that a lot of uh, human societies and philosophies and especially that in the West, our modern technological culture tends to view us as being separate from nature. We obviously are not, we're an intrinsic part of nature. And of course, with climate change and all the things that's happening in the world, we're really beginning to see the dramatic impacts that we have upon the earth, upon environment, upon the ecology. And there is this need for us to understand that we're really a part of this environment. And Ayurveda has been promulgating this idea for thousands of years. And so essentially Ayurveda is inspired from a naturalistic approach to life and living. So all the principles and practices of Ayurveda are rooted in that naturalistic understanding. And that's why Ayurveda has so much in common with other indigenous systems of medicine. The semantics might be different. The words that are used for different types of practices, or there may be different medicinal plants that are used, but at their core, the indigenous systems of medicine and Ayurveda are remarkably similar in their overall scope and practice. And so uh, what we're trying to do is utilize this wonderful, sophisticated knowledge that has evolved in India over thousands of years in an uninterrupted fashion. Really, Ayurveda is the oldest continuously practiced system of medicine on earth. And so you can just imagine there's an enormous amount of empirical evidence behind its practices. And that's evident in this system of preventative medicine that we call Dhinacharya. So what we're trying to do by practicing Dhinacharya is align ourselves with these natural rhythms and cycles as opposed to living in opposition to them, right? So essentially what we're doing by understanding this concept of dharma in our daily practice is to remove obstructions from our path, to make our life easier. And does that sound like a good thing? So there are three basic components of lifestyle medicine in Ayurveda, dhinacharya, sadvata, and rutacharya. So today we're just gonna touch on dhinacharya. Dhinacharya is a term that's derived from two words, dhina, which means daily and chaya which means regimen. The chaya also means to follow. So another way to understand the chaya apart from it being a daily regimen is to follow the day. Once again, meaning that we are inspired by this naturalistic relationship that we have with the earth, with the rhythms and cycles that exist within it. So the chaya is a way to align ourselves with those natural rhythms and cycles. Sadrata is more kind of a moral code, how you can behave and interact in your daily life with yourself, with others. So also to remove obstruction and to make your life easier. And Rutacharya refers to the seasonal regimen. Because of course, 
the environment changes over a period of a year. As the Earth makes its way around the sun, we go through these different seasonal cycles, and this has an impact upon our bodies. And as a result, Ayurveda has developed a system that allows us to live in harmony with these seasonal changes as well. One interesting thing, though, is, is that the seasonal changes that we experience here in North America are not the same as were articulated exactly in the subcontinent of India. So we have to kind of transpose those concepts and ideas for a completely different climate. So according to the Chalaka Samhita, which is the oldest, most venerable text, uh, with the exception of the Sushrutta Samhita, the Chalaka Samhita states that there are three pillars of life called the Tri Upastamma. And these consist of diet, sleep, and sexual activity. And so what Ayurveda says is that in order to maintain balance, all these three factors must be properly regulated. So if there's too much or too little of one, then it will create some type of imbalance. So likewise, just imagine if you're having too much sex and too much food, but not enough sleep, that's not going to lead to a good result, or too much sleep and uh, too little food, etc. We need to have these, all these different components in a kind of a perfect balance. Now, the orientation of Ayurveda generally is to recommend that people abstain from sexual activity, but that's more of a, a practice for Brahmacharya, for people that are undertaking a very specific spiritual path. One of the things I've appreciated about, uh, uh, about Ayurveda and uh, the Indian philosophy generally is just that it embraces sexual activity. It's a normal and natural part of life that is meant to be celebrated. It just needs to be practiced in a regulated fashion so as not to pleat ourselves. So these three components of food, sleep, and sex activity need to be in balance as we live our daily lives. Now, to understand the practice of Dhinacharya, we have to have knowledge of the doshas. Tridosha Siddhanta. This is understanding of the doshas. And the doshas are really the focal point for understanding all the different principles and practices of Ayurveda. And I could literally spend days just talking about the three doshas, and I don't have that opportunity. I just had a very short time. And so what I've presented here is a diagram that helps to articulate the basic interactions of the three doshas. I'll just move to a larger screen so you can see it even better. This is a, a, an image that I developed for my book, Food is Medicine, in 2011, which draws upon many different types of practices, but uh, predominantly Ayurveda, as well as Western uh, nutrition and other systems of traditional medicine, including Chinese medicine, Yunani, etc. So hopefully I don't need to get into describing the three doshas, that those of you that have joined me today understand it as a basic concept. And there's many different ways to understand the doshas. The doshas aren't so much a material substance that can be identified as they relate to a cycle, a relationship. So I like to think of the three doshas as representing the beginning, the middle, and the end of things. Okay, and so this is what this chart represents so that we can see the three doshas of kapha, pitta, and vatha are there in the middle of the diagram. And we can see all the relationships of the, the gunas, the qualities, the, the, the stages of life, the seasonal cycles, the daily rhythms, as well as even the impact upon digestion. And so what we need to know about this is how did the three doshas affect the daily and seasonal uh, rhythms? And so everything begins or has its beginning in kapha. And so you can see the qualities that surround the three doshas in that diagram. Cold, heavy, wet, hot, light, and dry. I'm just going to use the English terms for, for ease of understanding here. But of course, they are known by their Sanskrit names. So kapha begins in cold. It's like the beginning of the day. You know, it's always cold. It's before dawn, isn't it? And this is the very beginning part of the day. And just as before the sun begins to rise, we have this period of coldness. And then the sun comes up, and this is the beginning of the day. And this is the kapha time of day. 
it's a very heavy time. You know, we've been sleeping all night long. And so if we wake up during this time, we wake up in this heaviness of sleep. This relates to kapha. Likewise, if you get up early in the morning and you step outside, it's gonna feel cold, even in the summertime, when normally it might feel quite warm and hot during the day, in the morning, it's gonna feel quite cold. And there's gonna be this heaviness to the environment. You might see, maybe in the grass of your lawn, you might see that there's dew that is gathered. Uh, and there's like a certain kind of heaviness of, of wetness that uh, that's like a blanket over the, the earth. And it's this quality that we wake up into that gradually begins to dissipate as the sun gets higher and higher in the sky. So in the morning, the predominant dosha, which is active, is always kapha. And you can feel that. And what's interesting is that this is understood and regarded as being an important component of the daily rhythm and pattern in India. And so when people get up in the morning, they don't get up and rush off to work. It's a slow, gradual unfolding of the day. So people will get up actually quite early in India, but they don't necessarily just shoot off to work. And, you know, so people might be up at, you know, four or five in the morning, but the shops won't open until eight, nine o'clock. And that gives people a period of time in the morning to slowly understand the influences of the day and to align themselves with these rhythms and especially to this quality of kapha, so the slow, gradual unfolding of the day. And that's why it is important in Ayurveda to get up early enough in the day so that you have an opportunity for this slow, gradual unfolding of the day. Because what kind of day do you think you're going to have if you get up, uh, you know, like 10 minutes before you have to leave the house? And that's the way a lot of people manage their life, isn't it? The alarm goes off and they hit snooze, alarm goes off again, they hit snooze. And finally they get up, oh my God, jump out, out of bed, jump in the shower, you know, brush their teeth in the shower, you know, and then, you know, on their way rushing out of the house, just grab something quick and then eat it in the car on their way to work. You know, this is definitely not a lifestyle pattern that Ayurveda would advocate for. So we talk about getting up early in the morning in Ayurveda to give yourself a chance to align yourself with this daily rhythm and to create a sense of stability and peacefulness. This is the advantage of following this type of pattern, is, is that you can take advantage of the natural stira, the stable qualities that kapha engenders when you get up early enough during this period of time. So kapha is the influence that affects us primarily in the morning and then as the sun gets higher and higher in the sky, then we move into that pitta phase. And you can feel that. You can feel that. You can feel warmer. You can look outside and you can see that all that dew that was in the grass, all that mist that was hanging over the hills has now begun to dissipate because of the increasing influence of the sun. So we move into that pitta phase. Now, you might also notice that if you haven't eaten anything, and of course, it's not recommended also that first thing in the morning that you eat a bunch of food, because you're being predominantly affected by this kapha influence. So your appetite isn't going to be at its peak, certainly first thing in the morning. There are some exceptions to that rule. Some people do wake up very hungry. These typically tend to be either vatha or pitha individuals uh, and probably have some kind of imbalance or maybe they didn't eat enough the night before, etc. But normally you shouldn't be waking up ravenous. But what should be happening is, is that gradually your appetite will begin to increase as the sun gets higher and higher in the sky and we move into that pitta sphere of influence. And that's ideally when Ayurveda says that you should think about eating is later in the morning, uh, sometime, I recommend sometime between nine and noon to have your biggest meal of the day to help fortify you is another practice that a lot of us kind of miss out on is that we'll get up in the morning and, be, uh, and because we're rushed, you know, we'll eat just a little bit and usually something that's rich in carbohydrates, maybe some breakfast cereal, maybe a muffin or something. And of course, it plays havoc with our blood sugar. Blood sh sugar goes up and then insulin is secreted. It brings our blood sugar back down. And so you have a bowl of oatmeal at 8.30 in the morning. A lot of people by 10.30 in the morning are hungry. Or if they're not hungry, they're feeling irritable or feeling anxious. 
uh, they're not feeling settled within themselves. And so one of the practices that I've long learned to implement with my patients is to make sure that you're eating a grounding, neurostabilizing breakfast. So certainly not a rapidly digesting starchy breakfast first thing in the morning, but something that's going to slowly digest, something that is richer in fat and protein. And that's the way most traditional peoples eat all over the world, is they'll eat a breakfast that will help to give them enough energy to burn throughout the day. Probably a lot of you have heard about this practice of intermittent fasting. Well, Ayurveda suggests that you only eat twice a day, which is basically the practice of intermittent fasting. The only way I've been able to see that this can be successfully implemented is if you're eating in such a fashion, eating primarily savory foods that helps to ground, nourish, and stabilize you. And so you'd be having this meal somewhere between nine and noon, ideally in a relaxed environment so that you're not feeling rushed. And ideally in that pick the time of day so you have the best augmentation to your digestive fire. And then as the sun continues its movement across the sky, gradually descending towards the horizon, we move towards the end of the day. This is the Vatha time of the day. So remember what I said, this is that the three doshas also relate to this cycle of beginning, middle, and end. So Vatha always relates to the end of things. And so as we move towards the end of the day, then the qualities of vata begin to increase. And so, you know, we've spent all day working, we've been busy, and so it's natural to feel like around three or four o'clock in the afternoon to feel that your focus is starting to shift a little bit. You're working hard and now all that is beginning to deteriorate. That's a natural function of just moving through the day. And so we need to honor that ideally and take a break and also get some additional nutrition to help stabilize us. So ideally, we will have our last meal of the day during the Vatha period of the day before the advent of the evening, right? So if we look at this chart as well, you can see, and, and, and the, 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 the second uh, outer concentric circle that relates to the times there, we have six, nine, 12, and three. So as we move around towards the end of Vata, this would be around six o'clock. Of course, it's gonna change significantly depending on which time of the year. So this is just kind of a generalization, but Ayurveda would recommend that you eat your last meal before the sun sets and not during the Kapha time. And the Kapha time would be after the sun sets and the beginning of the evening, right? So remember what I said, the three doshas relate to the beginning, the middle and the end of things. So the beginning of the evening is a kapha period of time. And so to align ourselves during, uh, with, with that natural cycle, we want to eat before that kapha period. Because that kapha period of the evening is all about developing that neurostability and quietude that prepares us for a healthy sleep later on. And ideally that's going to happen somewhere between the hours of 6 and about 10 o'clock at night. So somewhere during that time, you might notice, many of you might notice that, you know, 7.30, 8 o'clock, you're, oh, you're feeling a little tired, you know? But then what a lot of us do is we'll just flick on the television and boing, we'll stare at light on our laptops or on our phones. All the lights in the, in the house are illuminated. And of course, we know this suppresses the secretion of melatonin, which helps to maintain this diurnal cycle of, 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 of wakefulness and, and sleeping. And so we end up inhibiting this natural flow of, of the day. And in large part, the, this is the problem of the fault of electricity, which of course we all have to contend with. But this was never a problem before electricity. I know this firsthand. I'm, some of you might have experienced this when you go camping. If you don't have a lot of electric light, and you've been hiking all day and you are out busy swimming in the lake or whatever, and then you uh, have your evening meal and then you're sitting around the fire. Yeah, by eight or nine o'clock at night, you're feeling pretty tired and off you go to bed. So that's the natural way of, of things. And of course, in our modern technological environment, we do lots of things to disrupt that, but we need to have an awareness of that. So one thing I recommend definitely that people do 
in the evening is to turn down the lights in their home. Turn off the overhead lights, just leave on some area lights, and then don't spend the, the rest of the evening staring at the television or some screen without modifying its illumination if you have an expectation of having a good sleep. So we want to get to sleep during that kapha time. Of course, what happens if we don't fall asleep during that time and then we stay up till 11, midnight, then we move into that, the middle of the night, the pitta time of night, and we are then deprived of the natural somnolent activity of kapha. You know, kapha is heavy in nature, right? So when we're in that kapha phase, we feel heavy and stable. It's, it's the quality of sweetness. And isn't falling asleep representative of that quality of sweet? But if we stay up too late, then we move into this, these, these qualities that we associate with tastes of pungency and sourness and salty, which are all activating to the digestive fire. It's no surprise that a lot of people, when they stay up too late, they get hungry again and they end up eating at midnight, which is not advisable. Uh, and so we can address a lot of issues with insomnia if we can conform to these natural rhythms and cycles. If we get up early enough uh, and, and are active throughout the day, and we don't eat too late, and then make sure we get to bed before the, at the time of night, then we help, it helps to balance ourselves and coordinate our actions and behaviors with these natural rhythms and cycles. So you can also see that the, the doshas relate to different parts of the body. Kapha relates to the upper portion of the body, uh, and pitta to the middle portion of the body, and vata to the lower parts of the body. And specifically, we can see how that relates to the different uh, organs of digestion and the different phases of digestion. So the first part of digestion, when the food is in the mouth and you're chewing it and swallowing it, is going into the upper portion of the stomach. This is the kapha phase of digestion. And then when the lower esophageal sphincter closes and the stomach starts churning and then, then squirting the chyme into the small intestine and there under the influence of all the different digestive enzymes, the brush border enzymes, uh, the bile that's excreted by the liver and the gallbladder, this represents the pitta activity to break down and digest the food. It's this cooking function. And then the final phase of digestion is when that food, once all the nutrients have been extracted from it, is then deposited into the colon where there is uh, this function of dehydrating the stool a little bit to reabsorb any excess of water. But then essentially what the colon is doing is to create a waste product, which we then excrete. So we have these three different phases of digestion that also correspond to the three doshas. And you know, a simple clinical clue that we can utilize is understanding when people have digestive issues is understanding how soon after they eat something do they have symptoms so if it's relatively soon after eating something that they have some issue it probably relates to kapha if it's um, maybe four to five hours after they've eaten then it probably relates more to pitta and then if it's more like eight to ten hours then it's going to be something that relates more to uh, a, a vatha disorder doesn't necessarily mean that that's the case. It's just like a little clinical insight into what the possibilities are when we use this understanding of the three doshas. So I won't spend too much more time talking about that. This particular chart, I found it very, very useful uh, for people to understand the interrelationship of the three doshas and how they affect the daily cycle, the seasonal cycle, as well as different aspects of digestion. So when we talk about Dhinacharya, there are many different components. And once again, I'm not going to be able to cover or review all these different components. I'm just going to give you a highlight of some of the, 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 the major elements. And so the first one here is the Brahma Mahurta. So I made reference to this already. Ayurveda states that you should get up early in the morning, ideally just before sunrise. This is called the Brahma Mahurta, the time or zone of Brahma. Brahma, of course, is the creator god uh, in the Hindu pantheon. And so essentially what's happening is that we're waking during a time when the day is recreating itself. And there's all kinds of benefits that we can receive from this because there's a lot of creative 
function behind the activities of Brahma. So when we get up during this time, we are harnessing that creative power. We are aligning ourselves with the recreation of the universe that happens essentially for us every day with, 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 the, with the advent of this new daily cycle. So it's, I recommended that you get up early in the morning, ideally by sunset, to align yourself with this natural rhythm. And you know, I, it, it, it helps to solve many different issues. You can solve issues of insomnia, you can solve digestive issues, uh, you can like such as the proper elimination of wastes. If you get up during the Vata time of day, then you harmonize yourself with that Vata period. And remember what I said about Vata relating to the end of things, that all the waste that's in your body that is accumulated during sleep and is ready for evacuation, when you get up during this Vata period, your body will naturally excrete it. But if you if you wait too long and then you wake up during the Kapha time, let's say you get up at nine or 10 o'clock in the morning during the Kapha time of morning, then that natural flow of Vata is obstructed. So, in, in, you know, over the 23 years of practice, uh, I have had a lot of success in treating issues such as constipation and digestive sluggishness by simply having people get up during this time, during the Bhagavad Mahurta, to align their bodies with this natural rhythm. Also, it's the best way to make sure that you get to bed on time, right? Is to make sure that you get up early. Usually people are like, well, I'm going to go to bed early tonight uh, so, I, you know, so I can get up early. It doesn't work that way. You've got to go, you've got to get up early and then naturally you'll go to bed early. So it begins with the difficult practice of forcing yourself to get up at the right time. And once you establish that rhythm, it's, it's very easy. I know that there is this belief or perspective that there are night owls out there, and I don't think it's true. I, maybe in rare exceptions, there are people like that, but it is just an adaptation to our modern technological environment where you've got things to distract you that would keep you awake during the night. Because if you didn't have electricity and it was pitch black out, why would you just sit there in the dark? What would you do? You would go to sleep. And I've seen this many, many times, right? So this whole notion that pe some people are naturally night owls, I don't believe it. It's just a function of, uh, of, of electric light and how it stimulates us at the wrong time. So as I mentioned, getting up during the Bama Mahertha will naturally help with the evacuation of wastes. And one thing I recommend that you do first thing in the morning, you get up and you drink 750 ml of of, of lukewarm water. You can put a little bit of lemon in there. You can put uh, some ginger juice, a squeeze of lime perhaps. And we can use those, uh, a little bit of a uh, pinch of pink salt and each of those different components addresses different doshas. So the ginger is for the kapha, the sandava is for the pitta, and the, uh, the lemon, the lime is more for the vata. Uh, and you can take them all together or in different combinations to treat different imbalances of the doshas or not. You don't have to, you can just drink water uh, just on its own. But that practice of getting up first thing in the morning and drinking water in that kind of volume has a natural cleansing activity. It helps to stimulate diuresis and helps to prevent as well as treat a lot of genital urinary problems. So for people that have genital urinary problems, this is something that I tell them that they must do is get up in the morning and drink this water to flush the system. And what it does, it helps to reset the whole genital urinary flow. So if you've got genital urinary issues, this will play a part in helping to resolve them. Uh, constipation. Okay, I don't have a lot of time to talk about constipation, but obviously a lot of people do suffer from constipation. Ayurveda says that you should have at least one to two bowel movements a day. And of course, many people make their way through their life and don't even have like uh, one once a day. So there are a huge number of things that we can do to make sure that you do eliminate. Uh, when we eliminate on a regular basis, then we are making sure that the wastes that our body naturally produces don't accumulate and intoxicate us. So we eliminate them. And so you can make changes in your diet. You, uh, you can take, uh, drink water, as I mentioned, first thing in the morning, 
to help move your bowels. Uh, and of course, there are many different herbs and other things that you can take to help deal with this issue. Of course, AAA is a very common formula that's consumed uh, and it is helpful for most people, but is also is a little drying for some people. So it's not optimal for everyone. And sometimes you might need to combine it with different herbs or try a different approach. Sometimes the issues of the reason why someone's constipated is because there's too much dryness and AAA won't help that. Instead, we might use something like a bulk laxative, like a sabkul, which is the psyllium husk. But if you consume that, you need to make sure you consume enough water, because if you don't, it will plug you up. And of course, what is a poop? A poop is mostly bacteria. So if you're not able to produce a healthy bowel movement, then there's something wrong with your gastrointestinal microbiome, and it needs support. And that begins first with consuming the right foods that helps to create a healthy gut microbiome, as well as consuming specially prepared probiotic foods and sometimes supplements if you can't eat those foods, such as sauerkraut and, and other uh, lacto-fermented pickles. I've got some of these recipes in my book, Food is Medicine, to help replenish your gut microbiome. Also some measures for diarrhea. I'm not really gonna get into that so much, but uh, there's lots of different approaches that we can use for that as well. So then we get up and we've drunk our water, we've eliminated, evacuated the wastes, and now it's time to clean the mouth as per Ayurveda. And this is comprised of four components, Jivanirlekana, which is cleaning the tongue, filling the mouth or Gandusha, cleaning the teeth, Dantadavana, and then the use of gargles, Kavlaga. Now, you don't have to do all those things necessarily, but it, Ayurveda recommends that you do. And the first one, cleaning the tongue, you would use something like a tongue scraper to achieve that. Why do people do that? Well, of course, it gets off all that bacteria that's accumulated on your tongue, but your tongue is connected to the rest of your digestive tract. So when you scrape off this goo that is accumulated on your tongue, it has a reflex function on the rest of the body to encourage and enkindle Agni, the digestive fire. So we clean the tongue, not just to make it aesthetically look better, but to activate the digestive fire and prepare our bodies to eat our breakfast, whenever that may be. Gandusha, filling the mouth, typically with oil, also known as oil pulling, is also an excellent practice. Unfortunately, there's a lot of misinformation out there on oil pulling. And there, are, there was a guy who wrote a book uh, just on oil pulling and it, unfortunately people have come away with the impression that they should be swishing oil around in their mouth for up to 20 minutes and this is not the case. Uh, and in fact there's now evidence in the literature of people developing like a what's called a lipoid pneumonia where they're actually aspirating the oil because they're holding it in their mouth for too long. And if you hold the oil for too long in your mouth your body will produce a lingual lipase, which is a, a, an enzyme which breaks the fat down into its constituent parts, and then you're breaking the oil down, you're digesting it in your mouth, and you're not getting the benefits of the oil. So really all you need to do it is just for a few minutes, just pull the oil, squish it around in your mouth, and then spit it out. I recommend you don't spit it down your drain, because of course that will make quite the mess, so just spit it in the garbage uh, and, uh, and, and, and get rid of it that way. And then next, cleaning your teeth. Of course, nowadays we're all using toothbrushes and that's certainly fine. You can certainly use that as well. Originally what is used in India in an Ayurveda uh, is a tooth powder and you put the tooth powder in your palm and it's comprised primarily of herbs that are bitter, pungent and astringent in taste and that your finger is dipped in water into the powder and then you use your finger to clean your mouth. And I can tell you that in this way, you actually clean your teeth a lot more efficiently than using a brush because you can feel your teeth and you can get in behind the back teeth and you can get all the way around. So when you're using these herbal tooth powders, you can do a fantastic job. I will say though, if you are a consumer of sugar, which I don't recommend, then you probably are a candidate for something like a fluoride containing toothpaste because when you eat sugar, it dissolves the enamel, right? And so what you're doing by taking a fluoride containing toothpaste is to impregnate your teeth with, with fluoride molecules, fluoride atoms to make the dentin more strong. So it is a stopgap measure for someone that has a bad diet. Uh, but if you don't eat a lot of sugar, then you don't need the fluoride at all. 
And of course, we have the use of gargles. Uh, people use, you know, uh, products like uh, mouthwashes. Uh, in Ayurveda, of course, we're using natural products, uh, herbal products, herbal extracts, uh, instead of conventional mouthwashes that contain high levels of alcohol, which cause some damage uh, to the oral mucosa. Uh, and so, and I use a number of, um, of, of mouthwashes therapeutically in my practice. Uh, for example, I use uh, a mouthwash prepared from a herb called Spilanthes, which is a profound silagogue. So when you rinse your mouth with it, it causes your mouth to, to release saliva for at least a good 10 to 15 minutes. And this is your best protection against gum recession, is to make sure that you're producing enough saliva, right? So one of the reasons why as we age, we suffer from increased gum recession is because the mouth is too dry. And those conventional mouthwashes that contain alcohol promote that dryness. So we can use natural herbal products to help promote salivary secretion and to, which in turn helps to protect the gums and to decrease the bacterial cell count. So a lot of detail there. Also described in Ayurveda as cleansing the eyes. Um, difficult for me to get into this in any great detail. It's a little bit um, of, uh, of an advanced procedure, I'd say, for most people. But one simple thing that you can do is make an infusion of tripola and make sure it's properly filtered, then using an eye cup, and then you can clean your eyes first thing in the morning, particularly if you've got problems like uh, chronic conjunctivitis or there are some deficits with, with uh, the acuity of your eyes, maybe de declining vision as you're aging, then using something like this tripola infusion as well as consuming tripola, uh, as well as a host of other things like uh, foods rich in anthocyanins uh, are very helpful to help improve eye function. Of course, one of the best things for the eyes is breast milk. Uh, very nourishing for the eye and also very useful for correcting a number of different ocular disorders. We also recommend something called nasya. This is the application of a medicated oil to the nose. And of course, many of you have probably heard about neti. This is where you take an isotonic solution of water and that's poured through the nose and then it comes out the other nose, uh, the other nostril rather. Um, in fact, that is a much inferior technique to something like nasya where you inhale the nose and it goes down uh, goes up into the nasopharynx and down back back of the throat and then you spit out the mucus and the oil. It's a super effective technique for dealing with chronic nasal and sinus issues and for that we'll use a medicated oil such as anutaila but you can also use plain cured sesame oil as well and there are a host of other types of medications that you can use to treat uh, sinus problems. For example when your sinuses are blocked one of my favorite remedies is not to use oil, but you use a combination of, of, of honey, ginger juice, uh, and water. And you mix that up in equal portions and then put a few drops into each nostril, inhale that back. And as you can imagine, the ginger in there causes a local vasodilation. It opens all those little drainage channels uh, in the sinuses and allows you to get some relief. So there's lots of different techniques that we can use for nausea to help promote proper nose and sinus function as well. Um, mentioned about neti. And then typically after nausea, we're going to practice a technique of pranayama called analoma viloma or nadi shodhana, alternate nostril breathing. So I always recommend that in conjunction with the practice of nausea. Do the nausea first and then do the nadi shodhana. Therapeutic smoking, uh, dhumapana is also recommended in Ayurveda. It's certainly used in panchakarma and it's used as a post-operative procedure after nasya is administered in panchakarma. Uh, it's a little bit beyond uh, what I'm gonna talk about today. The key thing about therapeutic smoking is, is that you're inhaling it to the nose and expelling it out the mouth. It's not going into your lungs. A lot of people don't know that. And I've even seen practitioners in India and Nepal practice this incorrectly, where they just douse the patient in smoke. And that is not the correct way to do it, right? So it's, it's specifically going into the nose and then out the mouth. And this is to basically deal with and dry up all that congestion and kapha. 
that might have accumulated through some type of procedure like nausea. The other key thing after you've done these things, so you know we've done all these things, we cleaned the mouth, we've attended to uh, the, the, the health of the nose, is then to exercise. This is a key component of the daily pattern of Dinacharya and Ayurveda called Vyayama. Vyayama means to exert. And this is absolutely essential and a key component that a lot of people don't do or they, or they fail to practice. Or they practice something like yoga and they think that this is exercise. And this is actually a subject of, 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 uh, of, that, that I like to critique because yoga is not a form of exercise. It's turned into that here in the Western world, but originally yoga is more of a meditative technique. It's stiram sukham asanam, Patanjali says. The purpose of yoga is to, is to cultivate a stable, pleasurable position so that you can sit for extended periods of meditation. That is not the purpose of exercise. Exercise is to get your blood flowing, to get you panting, and to sweat a little bit. So you know that you exercise sufficiently in Ayurveda as per Dinacharya when there's a bit of sweat on your brow and a bit of sweat in your axilla. What Ayurveda says is you exercise to one half your capacity. So you don't exhaust yourself, but you do enough to discharge some of that energy. And it's just like an investment, like you invest your money in the stock market and you expect some return. The same thing is you release this energy in the morning and more energy comes back to you throughout the day. It's a very important component to deal with issues like uh, depression as well as anxiety and insomnia. Right? So what exercise does from a, a neurochemical perspective is that it helps to boost serotonin levels. Right? So it boosts serotonin levels. And so you feel good after you exercise. And then throughout the end of the day, your serotonin levels drop and they get really low right before sleep. And then you fall asleep. And then what kicks you into deep sleep is a second little wave of serotonin. But if you don't get that big wave of serotonin early in the day, you won't get that second wave of serotonin to help push you into deep sleep. And therefore your sleep won't be good. You will be agitated and have these crazy dreams, but you'll get into that deep state sleep, which is a rejuvenating form of sleep. So you exercise to help balance your brain and neurochemical secretion in your brain so that you get a good sleep. Massage is then practiced. Now, there's some difference of opinion on this. Some people will massage before you exercise. Some people will massage after you exercise. Classically, it's done before you exercise to help loosen up the muscles. But you know, depending on what kind of climate you live in, it might not feel comfortable necessarily to massage yourself before exercise. So either or, you can do either or. But massaging your body, abhyanga, is certainly recommended by Ayurveda. It's used on a daily basis to ward off old age. It, it, it deals with diseases of vata. It improves your vision. It nourishes the body. It promotes long life and good sleep and healthy skin. And in particular, you want to make sure that you're applying the oil to the head, to the ears, and to the feet on a regular basis. And then after this, bathing. So you've done your exercise and massage, and now it's time for bathing. And of course, in Ayurveda, we don't typically recommend using soap. Your body has a, a thin acid mantle that is a, an extension of the healthy bacteria that live on your skin. It protects your body. These are symbiotic bacteria that provide this benefit of, of countering the effects of other pathogenic bacteria. And if what you do every day is you strip that with detergents and soaps and shampoos, then you put your body at, 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 at more risk for infection and skin problems. So in Ayurveda, typically we don't use soap necessarily, or if you must, just use a very little bit, maybe for your armpits or something, the, the smelly parts. But otherwise, what's traditionally used in Ayurveda is some type of legume or bean powder or herbal powder uh, to absorb the excess of oil from massage and the sweat and the dirt and to discharge that. A little tricky with modern plumbing to do that. You know, when people are bathing in India, they're doing it outside. And so, you know, having a bunch of chickpea powder you know, falling on the ground is not so much of an issue. But yeah, if you've got a half a cup of chickpea pow powder that you're trying to flush down the, the bath drain every day, you might run into some problems. But there are some interesting, innovative workarounds that I also use in my practice that 
I would uh, be happy and willing to show you. And then this, after we've done our bath, after we've exercised, after we tend to cleaning the face and the evacuation of wastes, then this is the ideal time to practice something like Hatha Yoga, right? It is a form of meditation. It helps to ground you and prepare your body for extended periods of meditation. So I know there's many different forms of yoga and there's very vigorous forms of yoga, hot yoga. I'm not in agreement with these forms of yoga. Of course, people do what they want, uh, but from the perspective of Ayurveda, Hatha Yoga is about cultivating uh, this, this stira sukham quality, happiness and stability. That's the purpose of it. So you feel good in your body. So it's gentle, slow, relaxed, to create that blissful feeling within your body. And then following that is bhavana or dhyana meditation. This is something that we then do to help balance and promote equanimity of the mind. Throughout the day, we've got so many things going on. There's so many things that are distracting us. And of course, with the modern media, it, it can feel like it drives you crazy. So it's really important to cultivate meditation and the practice of mindfulness so you have an awareness of your own mental state. Essentially what we're doing is we're giving energy to the witness consciousness so that we can bear witness to our own mind and the machinations of the mind and not get caught up in them. So bhavana or meditation is like sitting on the banks of the river and watching the river flow past. You can see the ripples and the currents. You can see a little leaf or a twig flowing past. But med what meditation does is give you the ability to observe, watch it, and let it go. Otherwise, you're sitting on the banks of the river, you see something, and then you jump in after it. And then you're just carried all the way down the river. And that's the way most of us function. So we cultivate meditation to give us that ability of mindfulness to bear witness to our own mind so we don't get lost in its machinations. And then this, uh, following this, is then eating. This is when we would eat. So you can see why we tell people to get up early in the morning because there's all these things that you need to do in a nice, even, and relaxed pace. And by this time, after you've exercised and bathed and meditated, you should be ready for food. And and Ayurveda says that you don't want to completely fill your stomach up with food. You leave your stomach half empty and then leave one quarter part uh, to be filled with water and one quarter part empty. Okay? Because you need to leave room in your stomach so there's enough room for the food to mix around. After the lower esophageal sphincter closes and your stomach is full of food, there needs to be enough uh, space in the stomach so everything mixes together. If you just jam it full of food, you know, you can't mix things very efficiently in that way. And then what happens is it causes an upward pressure on the lower esophageal sphincter, then you get food moving up, reflux, hiatus hernia. These are all caused because people eat too much. The other key thing about eating in Ayurveda is to make sure that you don't eat if you're not hungry. A lot of people emotionally eat because they're bored or because they have something going on. Ayurveda recommends you eat twice a day. And so if you're eating optimally, you'll eat a neurostabilizing breakfast that's fairly rich in proteins and fats. It doesn't have to be super low carb or, or a high meat diet or anything. It can be vegetarian, but it's not a sweet breakfast. Not a sweet breakfast. And that has this neurostabilizing influence and you slowly digest it throughout the day, burn that energy, and so that you have a good appetite for your late afternoon, early evening meal that you would consume before the sun sets. And there's a mantra that you can chant before you uh, eat your food called the Bojan Mantra. Brahma Panam Brahmavi Brahmagno Brahma Mahutam Brahmi Vatina Guntavyam Brahma Kama Samadina I love this little mantra. The ritual is Brahman, the offering is Brahman, the tool used to make the offering is Brahman, and the fire to which the offering is consigned is also Brahman. For such a one who abides in Brahman, by this alone is Brahman attained. So yeah, there's a lot of detailed practices and protocols for eating. Uh, for example, 
when you finish eating is to not rush around and be busy, but to lie down on your left side to activate your right nostril. This is the Pingala Nadi. And by doing so, you will help to encourage or promote a uh, healthy digestive fire. You know, so that's likewise, when you go to sleep at night, you want to lie primarily on your right side to activate your left nostril to activate the Ida Nadi, uh, which, gives, which activates more the rest and restorative systems of the body. And then after you do this, then it's recommended to just go for a short walk, about 30 meters in length, uh, to just gently move about and not just sit there to prevent any kind of congestion that might accumulate immediately after eating. There are also rules for eating in Ayurveda. So activities such as exercise or sexual intercourse, studying or singing, you should delay them for about one hour after eating to ensure proper digestion. Right? So don't just eat and then try to work. You know, give your scent, yourself uh, some time to properly digest and metabolize the food. And then there are all these practices that Ayurveda recommends throughout the day. And this is where the, 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 the component of sadvata, basically uh, the, the, the moral and ethical framework of Ayurveda and the different practices that are implemented to remove obstruction in our day, especially by interacting with other people. So, you know, we all have our dharma. The purusharta begins with dharma, your purpose in life, artha, the accumulation of wealth and abundance, which includes sharing with others, kama, which is about reveling and enjoying in the satisfaction of creating abundance and fulfilling your duty, and then moksha, which is about cultivating the higher spiritual awareness. So our day is meant to uh, cultivate all these different practices in that, in that hierarchical fashion. So you're always oriented towards achieving dharma first. And then sexual activity. A lot of people ask about sexual activity. In Ayurveda, sex is an important component uh, and it, it's a very powerful experience that needs to be properly respected Ayurveda says there, it needs to be properly balanced with food and sleep, right? Those, the, the, the chaya upastamba, so that it's everything is in proper balance. So you have to have an awareness of your own body and how your body feels and to kind of question it and to kind of tap into what your body's experiencing before you can really understand you know, whether or not you should have sex, right? So you should have an awareness of what's happening in your own body and not just do it because of some compulsion, because someone wants you to do it. Um, it needs to be a natural expression. And there are a number of different practices in terms of the frequency of sex, different seasons would require uh, different limitations. For example, Ayurveda would say that sex could be more frequent in the winter months when it's cold. And that kind of makes sense because it keeps you warm, but in the summer it would be less frequent because you're already too hot and too drawn out. And, um, and with regard to the sexual organs themselves, Ayurveda recommends using oils to nourish the sexual organs. I've had many female patients that are perimenopausal, for example, that will have problems with vaginal dryness and sexual activity. Well, an easy workaround is to make sure that they anoint the genitalia with uh, an oil, something as simple as coconut oil, uh, uh, on a daily basis and then use that whenever they have or engage in any type of sexual activity. And this usually resolves the problem for most women. And that's it. So that was the quick and dirty Dinacharya lecture. Um, and I just wanted to mention that I also have a 25 hour Dinacharya lifestyle certificate program that we just launched this semester. It begins at the end of October and continues into early next year. It's uh, 24 hours of detailed lecture. You get a 180 page detailed course manual. There's an online discussion group. You have access to the recorded lectures. You will receive a certificate upon completion and you also get a free one hour lifestyle consultation with me where we can go through uh, the different components of your life and help to uh, utilizing all these wonderful practices help create a sustainable healthy practice for you as well. Uh, in addition to that, uh, I also have online academic programs. This is part of the greater mentorship program that I offer through my school. 
inside Ayurveda, Food is Medicine, and Phytomedica. They're very detailed programs for very serious students who want to uh, really cultivate this wonderful knowledge to help make themselves more effective practitioners. So, uh, and by the way, they're all at 50% off uh, COVID sale. So uh, you can learn more by going to dogwithbotanical.com courses and, and then uh, seeing what they have to offer. So I think there might be some questions and I thought I could just open it up to answer any that might be there. I think someone is asking on the oatmeal consider sweet breakfast. Sorry? Someone is asking, is oatmeal considered a sweet breakfast? It would be. You know, the way the Scots traditionally eat oatmeal, because of course oatmeal is considered to be a Scottish food, is they would have that in the morning with mashed fish brains. So it's a savory food. It is not a sweet food. And when you have oatmeal with chopped apple and maple syrup or brown sugar, it's gonna drive up your blood sugar and it's gonna cause a crash and that can lead to all types of issues. Now, depending on your prakriti, your constitution, or what you have going on, it may be more or less suitable for different people. But generally speaking, for active, busy, working people, including kids, I don't recommend it. I don't recommend it. It's like a dessert, essentially. Or you can see the question. I can't see any questions, but maybe I should stop my uh, the share here. Let's see. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So Chris has a question about what is the best form of exercise? That's a good question. So when we consider what Vyayama is, as per Ayurveda, uh, people would get up early in the morning and they would go to these Vyama salas. He's, and it's mostly men because women were busy at home, you know, uh, making roti and carrying water and carrying babies. And so they were already working out. I knew when you go to India and Nepal and you, and you look at the men, you look at the women, it's the women that are doing all the physical labor. I mean, the men do, but, you know, they both do it, but it's the women that do the most. So, okay, I'm not saying that's fair. But, and so let's transpose this for modern 21st, 21st century society. The closest type of, of exercise that would conform to what was originally or traditionally practiced would be something like military style calisthenics. So what I recommend as a simple practice is the, uh, is the XBX and the 5BX programs that was developed by the Royal Canadian Air Force in the mid 20th century. It was used to keep service people healthy. All it takes is 12 minutes and some walking or some running. So it doesn't take much in terms of time, but it's a, it's a muscle building calisthenic exercise. And it's as close, it's the closest thing that I've seen that would conform to some of the traditional practices, exercise practices that we would see uh, practice in ancient India. So there's another question here, eating three times is more common. So if we switch to two meals per Ayurveda, how do we do that? So, this is what I'm saying is, is that if you have oatmeal for breakfast, for sure you're gonna have three meals. You're probably gonna have four meals, you know? So you wanna front load the nutrition and, 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 and the protein and fat. Don't eat a sweet breakfast. It can be vegetarian, it can be non-vegetarian, whatever your needs are. Uh, but if you're not a vegetarian, for example, then having some eggs and veggies in the morning. Um, you know, I, I in the morning typically I have uh, eggs and veggies, and I make some homemade sourdough roti. And I have that at around 10 o'clock, and that keeps me going all the way until dinner time. So I only eat twice a day. But if I got up and I had oatmeal or breakfast cereal, I'll be hungry in an hour and a half or two hours, and I won't have a good day. Someone asked, is there an Ayurvedic way for treating glaucoma? Yes. There is, and really don't have enough time to address this issue. But what I will say is, is that glaucoma is a type of cardiovascular problem. It's basically damage to the microvascular circulation of the eye. So typically when we see problems with glaucoma, there are also metabolic issues. 
there's usually truncal abdominal obesity. So we have to deal generally with those metabolic issues and then apply specific medicines to the eye to deal with the leakiness and the damage and the nerve damage that's happening in the eye because typically of elevated blood sugar, uh, uncontrolled blood sugar. So uh, Deepa is saying, so breakfast, dinner, and breakfast, lunch. Yeah, so I suggest having your heaviest meal early in the day. This is when you're, you're like closer towards um, late morning, lunchtime. This is when your Agni is at its strongest. And this is when you can consume the heaviest fuel. And then towards the end of the day, you can think about having a lighter meal. There's this axiom, you know, breakfast like a king and to dine like a pauper. It applies here in Ayurveda as well. What we know, this is from the science perspective, is that people who eat less frequently live longer. So those of you that have been told to eat four, five, six times a day, it will likely be your undoing. Okay, so I'm wondering if there are any more questions. We have only have time for one more question. It's already three minutes after five. Okay. Are there any more questions? Do we unmute everyone? Looks like someone was just uh, admitted just at the very end, so they might have missed the lecture. Well, was this recorded? It was. Yes. Okay. And will it be available to, to folks to see? Yes. Okay. So uh, we can just let folks know. I guess going to the Ayurveda Association of Canada um, Facebook page, they could find that link. But it'll probably be on our YouTube channel. We're putting all the webinars on there. Um, okay. So thanks a lot, Todd. It was a very informative and wonderful um, talk on Dinacharya. Thank you. And um, I, I know some people entered late. I don't know if it was the time thing that confused people or what was going on, but um, I know we all enjoyed it and are very grateful that you're in the world doing your work that you are. Thank you so much. Thank you, Erica. You're welcome. And for all of you that are on the call, thank you for joining us. And um, we'll be in touch with you for our next um, webinar. And if you'd like to join the Ayurvedic Association of Canada, we'd very much like to have you as a member. We're a nonprofit spreading the word of Ayurveda across Canada, which is uh, getting to be an easier job now than it was when we started but uh, we still need all your support to be able to do that. So you can go to our website and uh, the Ayurvedic Association of Canada and there's all the information on how you can become a member and all the perks you can get for becoming a member. Um, Neelam, would you or Paul, would you like to add anything before we say no, goodbye? I would just like to thank Todd. It has been, I have known Todd for almost 25 years. And such a pleasure, you know, to see his beginning of Ayurveda career to now where he is. And the same thing is like when I started Sevanti, Todd has been, you know, since the day one. And so we have, you know, very interesting friendship and uh, collaboration and it's pleasure. It's, I really thank you for sharing your knowledge and information to AAC. Uh, viewers and we hope to bring you once again on different subjects and um, uh, I would like to thank everyone for attending this webinar and we want uh, people to become a member of AAC so that we can bring more speakers like Todd uh, and uh, our especially the Canadian um, Ayurvedic practitioners and authors to this platform. Thank you everyone for attending and um, I think that's it. Have a good evening. Thank good you. Good night everyone. everyone. Thank you. Yeah. See you soon. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Take care. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Can you turn the recording off, Neil? Yes.